Welcome to Man Alive Bible Study with Patrick Morley. Well, good morning, men. We are changing the name of Man in the Mirror Bible Study to Man Alive. So uh, I guess online we will probably call it Man, Man Alive Bible Study for searchability purposes, but I think we're going to just nickname it Man Alive. So around town, uh, when you walk in, when you're talking to each other, we're just Man Alive from now on. And then online we'll do Man Alive Bible Study. Speaking of online, so, so somebody is going to be joining us uh, for this. Uh, we're doing this series, From Broken Boy to Mended Man. And I, I visualize this, the videos that we're doing here, being used in small groups in conjunction with guys doing the book in, in various places, uh, both here and abroad. And so just kind of keeping that in, in mind, we do want to always welcome those people who are joining us for either the videos or online. So uh, that warm, rousing man in the mirror, welcome on three, one, two, three, hoorah. hoorah. Welcome, man, we're glad to have you with us. So the, the arc of what we're doing is we are looking at first unraveling what happened to you or a loved one that has made them into a person who... So uh, how many of you have a rescue dog or have done rescue dogs before? A few of you have. Uh, we have a rescue dog. There are different reasons that dogs need to be rescued, abuse and neglect being the primary ones, and then those that are neglected could either be uh, mean neglect or it could be a loving family who just didn't have time for the dog. But when a dog gets rescued, it has the tendency to have behaviors that are odd. And so, for example, you might simply raise your hand like this uh, in front of your dog, and the dog might shrink away. And broken boys, who end up being broken men, also can exhibit some of those same characteristics. So to review, we, we've looked at, and it, we, the first time we got together was an introduction. The second time we got together last time, uh, it was focused on uh, looking at uh, how parents have wounded you or your loved one, and we talked about the right cocktail of love structure roots and wings is good parenting, and uh, if you had that kind of parenting, you would say, my parents were affirming or encouraging, but if you didn't have that right cocktail of love structure roots and wings, then you might say, my parents were passive, absent, permissive, enabling, demanding, angry, or belittling. And so now, what do we want to do this week? So those are the causes. This week, we want to look at the effects. In other words, how childhood wounds affect adults. What are the leftover results of that? How does that manifest in you today? In other words, when somebody raises their hand, do you flinch? Or when somebody raises their hand, do you bite? And so let's just look at this little statement here. You've all seen this before. Dr. Sandra Wilson said, she wrote a book of this title, Hurt People Hurt People. So childhood wounds are something that has, have been done either to you or to your loved one. It's not your fault. It's something that was done to you. And those childhood wounds then have a way of developing into characteristics or attributes or behaviors. And so the big idea for the day is this. The first step for you or your loved one to mend is to see how you were hurt, to see how you hurt today. And so we're going to look at the, uh, the verse that I want to throw out for today, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, for we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So what we're seeking to do is to, to heal or to help someone heal or to understand why someone is broken and then be equipped to understand what's going on. And I think I said this last time, 
a lot of times when we get together for something like this, we're talking about, okay, what do we want to learn today that can help us change and be transformed going forward? And what we also have to do is understand that sometimes we need to understand how we got where we are before we can make those changes. It's a pretty simple thought. So we're going to look at nine major characteristics of men with childhood wounds, and we're going to look at four of them today. The first one is you have a hard time believing that people really care about you. Dr. Eric Erickson, the well-known developer of his system of uh, child development, says that the first task of a child is trust versus mistrust. And when a child doesn't get the ap appropriate affection, uh, the, the appropriate attention from its parents, especially at an early age, the child then grows up feeling like maybe the world is not a safe place, maybe the world is not a place that can be trusted. And so uh, just I'm weaving in some personal things here as we go along, but I've already mentioned, I think, that, that I, 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 this is the way that I, I grew up. And so I had a deep feeling of um, being on my own. Technical term is abandonment. And so my counselor calls it gross abandonment. I didn't see it that way because my parents are really nice. And as it turned out, we reconciled and I loved them very much. And we're going to talk about how we do all of those things later on in the series. But right now, the question is, do you struggle in your relationships because of mistrust? Uh, or does the person you love struggle in their relationship with you because they mistrust you because they have a childhood wound? Or is it a friend? Do, when you walk into a room are you unsure of yourself? Do you lack self-confidence? Do you, are you waiting for the next shoe to drop? Or do you expect people to let you down? Do you have a hard time believing that people really care about you? Now, I've been healed, and I, but I still walk with a limp. And so unless I'm walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, then it is my general first tendency to assume that you're not going to like me, that, that you're not going to care. Now, I don't actually live that way, but if I, again, if I'm not walking in the power of the Spirit, that would be, that would be my default. I would just assume that you're going to let me down. I would just assume that you're going to abandon me. I would just assume that I can't trust you. And the question is, that's, that's my flinch, Okay. That's my flinch. I've been rescued, okay? I have a loving father in heaven. And as it turned out, I had loving parents too. We worked all that out. But so I don't flinch anymore. I do believe that when you tell me you love me, that you really mean it. I really do believe that. But there was a time when I didn't. Question is for you whether it's for you or a loved one, do you, do you struggle, do you have a struggle to believe that people really care about you? We're going to be able to work through that in the weeks ahead. The second characteristic of men with childhood wounds, you are oversensitive and often misread what people intend. Dr. James Garbarino wrote a book called Lost Boys, and in this book he, he talked about young boys who have been either abused or neglected tend to develop a repertoire of four different behaviors, and uh, one of those behaviors is that we respond, over-respond, we're oversensitive, we're hypersensitive to perceived negative social cues, and so uh, David uh, had four children. He would walk into the family room. His wife and four children would be there. They'd be laughing. They'd be having a good time. And David would walk in. 
And then he noticed that within 15 minutes, he was sitting alone. And this went on for years and years and years. It was because he was so oversensitive that he was offended by every little thing. He got a little offended. Then he got prickly when he was offended. And so people, even his own family, did not really want to be around him. He didn't know what was going on at the time. Eventually, he got it figured out. And I think today he's leading a very healthy life. And the idea is that uh, you, if you are a person who is oversensitive around other people and you're misreading what other people say, they know that. They know that. And this, this is often leads to them withdrawing uh, because they just don't know how to handle that. So you, it, this could be you or this could be someone that you love, one of your loved ones, somebody you care about. If there is this oversensitivity there, there is a way to get past this, and we'll be talking about that in the weeks ahead, but right today we're talking about how childhood wounds affect us as adults. So you have a hard time believing that people really care about you, or you're oversensitive and frequently uh, misread what people intend. And the third characteristic, you are easily angered. You are easily angered. So, well, enough about me. <laughs> when I was in high school, my parents didn't treat us the same. I was the oldest, and the, there are some birth order things going on there, but my younger brothers, my three younger siblings, they would either borrow something of mine without asking, or they would ask and then they wouldn't return it, and then they would make it difficult for me to get whatever it is back that I wanted, whether it was well, actually, I let my, 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 one of my brothers borrow my motorcycle one time. It was a brand new motorcycle, brand new Triumph Bonneville motorcycle, brand new Triumph Bonneville motorcycle. And I let my brother borrow my motorcycle, and he said he wanted to just drive it around the block. Well, he took it, and he's gone for two hours. And when he got back, I, you know, I, I can't tell, I can't say on this video how the things that I felt and the things that I said to him. And I actually had a large crescent wrench. I mean, like a giant crescent wrench, like that big. And I was, I was ready to, 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 to clobber him if my dad intervened. And what did my dad do? Well, my dad took off his leather belt, the one that had the little mark in the middle of it where it had been folded over as a strap so many times. You know, it was, it was in a permanent position. And... Uh, and I got the whipping while my brother looked on with that I got you again sneer on his face. And so I hated my brother. I literally hated my brothers. I don't think I've ever hated anybody else, but I did. I hated my brothers for the, the way they did that uh, to me. And, uh, and so, but that unfair treatment, and everybody gets treated unjustly. Jesus, if there's Anything that we would say that was unfair uh, about how someone would, would be treated, we would say that Jesus was perhaps the most unfairly treated, most unjustly treated person that ever lived. And so we're trying to have in us that mind which was in Christ Jesus. We are trying to have the attitude of Christ. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, for, for it is commendable when you bear up under the pain of unjust suffering because you're conscious of God looking to Jesus as our example. He didn't return insult. He didn't retaliate. However, in order to actually be a mended man, we have to actually process through these things. A lot of times in Bible studies like this, and maybe I've done some of it too, we just kind of gloss over how we got in the position we are in without addressing the, the, 
the reasons that we are here, the causes of it, and the effects that it's having on us now. And so we're not doing a gloss. We're taking the time to try to unravel what happened and look at how it is affecting us today. You are easily angered. Are you easily angered? Is your loved one easily angered? Do you fly off the handle? Uh, do people have to walk around you on eggshells because they don't know what's going to set you off? And then the fourth for today, so you're not sure that people really care about you. You're oversensitive and often misread what people intend. You're easily angered. And then number four, you're not sure what healthy male behavior looks like. So this could take on many uh, forms, but my, like my dad, my dad didn't have a dad. My dad was abandoned when he was two years of age. So he, he never had an example of what it looked like to be a, a godly man, a godly husband, a, father, a godly father. He never had an example of what it looked like to be a man a husband or a father, and so he was left to basically guess at all of that about how to be a, a husband to my mom, a father to my three younger brothers and me. <clears throat> and you maybe didn't have a good example of that too. And so when it comes to, okay, what does it look like to be um, a man? What does it look like to be a husband? What does it look like to be a father? What does it look, how do I find work that's suited to who I am? Uh, how do I figure out who I am and what my life is all about? What seem like, maybe for you, hopefully, easy questions to answer, or, but maybe not, because you uh, have these characteristics of a broken boy, uh, and one of them being you're just not sure what healthy male behavior actually looks like. So, I had a very awkward start to manhood as a high school dropout who ended up in the Army. Uh, Army was, was very good for me because I came from a, an undisciplined background, uh, not enough structure. I was angry at the world, not because I had too much structure. Uh, some of you may have had uh, parents who were very demanding and, and tough on you, or, or it may be angry and belittling too. And so that would be too much structure. I had the opposite situation. I had no structure. So I was, the nice thing about riverbanks, riverbanks give you direction and velocity. I had no riverbanks. I was, you know what a, you know what a river is without banks? It, it's a stagnant pond. And uh, yeah, there's no structure. I had no structure. I had no riverbanks. I had no direction. I had no velocity. I was just kind of in, in a little small eddy over on the side of the lake with little molecules of water swirling around going nowhere. And uh, I was so miserable. So when I got in the Army, that was actually a pretty good thing because the Army has a very, uh, very strong structure and, and walls. And uh, so anyway, I ended up responding to this structure. And I became a, a specialist for in the minimum amount of time. You start out as a private, then a PFC, and so forth. Spe a spec four ranking in the minimum amount of time. And I was so proud of myself. Uh, I responded to the structure. And then I didn't make E5 or sergeant in the minimum amount, uh, amount of time. And so I went to my master sergeant and said, said, did I do something wrong? Uh, why didn't you promote me to sergeant uh, in the minimum amount of time? And, and he didn't really answer me, and so I started bugging him, and I started bugging him. Like, every day I would say, well, I was trying to get him to explain to me why he hadn't promoted me. Finally, he sat me down, and he said, son, the more you pester me about this, the less interested it makes me in promoting you. I had zero emotional intelligence, I had zero, situ well, not zero, but very low emotional intelligence, very low situ situational awareness. I didn't understand what it meant to be a healthy man. That might be you. That might be a loved one. These are the first four 
of nine characteristics. Next time we get together, we will look at the other five of these characteristics, the big idea. The first step, though, for you or your loved one to mend is to see how you hurt, to see how you hurt. And the questions that help to frame that are the questions you'll be discussing. discussing. Number one, to what extent do you struggle to believe that people really care about you, maybe give an example. Number two, do others accuse you of being oversensitive or taking things too personally, give an example. Number three, is there something that routinely triggers your anger and how are you able to control it? Number four, is there a particular area of your life where you struggle to understand what normal healthy male behavior looks like and if there is, who is someone who could take you under their wing and show you the ropes? So let's pray, and then you'll do your questions together. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we know that there is no temptation that we have encountered that is unknown to, to Jesus. We know that you want us to no longer conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so we do want to take every thought captive to make it obedient to Jesus. And we do want to be the disciples that are talked about by Jesus and by the apostles in the New Testament. And we have endeavored to do that, but something, something for some of us or someone we love, something is holding us back, keeping us from getting to that place of renewal. And so we pray that you would help each of us to self-assess and then maybe to help our loved one self-assess how we might have one of these characteristics that's turning others off, that's making it difficult for us to live with, that's making us difficult to make the transition from the way of the world to the way of Jesus. We pray that you would give each of us wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in. Subscribe to take part in future Bible studies. We release a new study every week and have groups around the country that gather together to go through these together.